is actually offline now because I can't get online. But this was in Punicherry just a few days ago at the French Institute. I don't know if you recognize anybody. This is a Facebook page from last week. <laughs> I'm not online, so I can't show you any, uh, any, uh, all the pictures, but that's what funny it was. Like this one, you see? So this is not so serious, you know? Like this was in Costa Rica, I was, I was coding, and all of a sudden the little cat came, and he was sitting down on my keyboard, and with his little Kitty butt was pressing down one key and was uh, messing up my last two school. And then it was so cute, I was just taking a picture of it. Uh, but I also post like new software uh, capabilities and so on. And maybe if I get a copy of the room picture today, that will also eventually end up there. Okay, but on to more serious things. Um, we did a very short lighting processing pipeline just before lunch. Uh, I gave you a tile of data and you all loaded it into the software. And that tile was not classified. It was just sort of the classification set, uh, sort of just the points as they are collected by the plane and then cut into a tile with multiple slide times overlapping. And we use last ground with the algorithm that I described to find the ground points. Of course, those are the ground points, not the ground points. Those are the ground points according to my software. If you use a different software, you get slightly different ground points. And if I give you the file, and a lot of times you say, okay, now you go and you mark all the ground points, you again get a different number of points. Because what is ground and what is not is a bit subjective. Sometimes it's not even clear. Like imagine you have a ground, a landscape, and now you have a ramp made from earth going up to a parking area or like a, a ramp going up to the loading dock. Now, at what point does the ramp become uh, no longer ground? Clearly the loading dock is not ground anymore because then there's an edge. But same with the bridge. You know, where does the bridge, where does the road stop being ground but being bridge? It's not really clearly defined um, what's ground always. Hence, for ground algorithms, typically when you see that a mountain top is chopped off, then you know objectively that's a mistake. Or when you see a building is inside the ground classification, that's also a mistake. Those are mistakes where most people will agree on. Now, a building should not be ground, and the top of the mountain should not be cut off. It should be ground. Those are typical mistakes you will find in classification software. When you use the wrong parameters, they will also happen in my software. But by changing the parameters, you can usually get what you want. Okay. And then we use the ground that we created to create a digital terrain model, DTM, and a digital surface model, DSM. Some people use the term digital elevation model, DEM. Now, I try to not use it because it's not really clear what you mean. DEM, <coughs> elevation of what? Elevation of the terrain, elevation of the surface. Uh, so I, like, I use DEM for everything for all things derived from um, LiDAR. So that's why the two last two then, it can compute the DTM, the first return, DSM, the last return, DSM. It can also compute uh, canopy height models, CHMs, um, where the elevation really is the height above ground. Okay, what I want to do with you now is to do a a full LiDAR project. And I want to start with the flight lines. 
I think that's the best. Uh, we have about time for one complete project today. And looking at the options, um, you know, we could do the, the two projects I already have, Ayupaya and Turingia. Turingia is in Germany. Ayutthaya is much closer, and it also has some temples in it and so on. So I think that's a more interesting data set. Before I start, I would like to give you an intuitive feeling for what we're going to do. Uh, there is a folder called France, and I would like you to go to that folder now with your uh, Internet Explorer. And you will find the raw LIDAR files, and I'll just show them to you now. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to do that as well. I'll just show them to you. That's in the files. Um, a, a number of strips, including some arrow points, like here's some arrow points, really. Let's put in another one. This one has a lot of error points. Probably a cloud or a dusty day. You see all these points up here in the air? They are all first returns, except here's even a single return. Must be the, maybe if that's a bird, a flock of birds. These are all unclassified. Oops. Unclassified scripts from one tile. They are, if I pick them, they're not classified. The reason I can just double click is because I use last view as the default of the uh, application to open LZ files. But this is unclassified. And now I show you, just so you get an idea, I don't always use the GUI. Usually I write scripts or command line, and these scripts are in, in here. Uh, what we will do next, we will do a quality check. And this implements it completely. So if you just double click the script, click it, it starts doing all these things. It created this folder here and all these contents. And it was all done with last tools, but it was done with automatic scripting. And I can almost use this script for every other LIDAR too. And it created pictures, a number of pictures, for example, it created a density grid showing me how dense the data is. It's like coding where I have five shots per square meter or more, giving it the red color. Well, that wasn't very clever because it's almost everywhere five shots. So I made another image where red means now where I have 10 LIDAR shots per square meter or more. It's red. So now I can see the distribution of the LIDAR shot density. Um, this is a typical quality checking. Here, this is created by last overlap and we will do that next with our data. Here you see how many flight lines are overlapping. Blue, which you don't really see here, would be one flight line. Uh, uh, the, the agua color means that two flight lines are overlapping. And yellow means that three flight lines are overlapping. So you can see how much overlap you have in your flights. And here at this point, we even have four flight lines overlapping. Flight lines. One flight. Flight line is basically um, how LIDAR is collected. You fly one strip and then the plane turns around. And usually as you fly one direction, maybe for three kilometers, maybe for five kilometers, maybe for 20 kilometers, when the plane turns around, you stop the LIDAR and then you turn around and then you turn it on again and you fly back. And each of these is a different strip and you can see the plane movement on the ground, uh, uh, strongly exaggerated, because you can imagine the plane has a 
has light out shooting out of its belly. And the light and the plane goes through turbulence, small turbulence. But at the belly of the plane, I have a fan of lasers. It's like a fan, you know, like the fan, like a Chinese fan, like to fan myself, made from light. And it's gigantic. It has an extent of one kilometer. Because that's how high the plane of flight. Now, if the, if the plane makes a slight movement, that fan makes a huge movement on the ground, and the edges of the fan basically, that's what you see here, moving. The other quality product that I'm generating oops, is this one. This is a color coding of the differences in elevation between the different flight lines. Because whenever I have an overlap between two flight lines, I look at a point from this flight line, and I look at a point from this flight line. And in the perfect world, these points are more or less exactly at the same elevation. But in the real world, there are lots of little errors that are happening. So I can make a difference between the elevations and then code it as a color when the, when the difference is big. I code it as big red or big blue, strongly red, strongly blue, depending on the, on the direction the difference goes. And I let it white otherwise. And that's a typical good example when actually things are pretty going well. Because in all open areas where the laser from all directions should be seeing the same thing, it's white. The only places where it's not white is along the edges of the building. And it's compulsory to have overlapping um, if you don't have any overlap, you can, for example, not check if your LiDAR is um, correct. Because only in the overlap you can see is one flight line and the other flight line actually fitting together properly. How many watches overlap? What is the percentage? Uh, the percentage is, you, you say what the percentage is, usually when you order the LiDAR data. Um, this, I think, has like 200% overlap, because this is very high overlap. Often also when you want higher density and the laser system owned by the company can either not produce the density or they cannot fly so low, they just fly more often and create the density through multiple flights. And especially then you want to make sure that the flights give you in the overlap image something where everywhere where it's open, all open roof, all flat roofs, all parking lots, all the roads. The difference image should be white. And that's one of the fundamental uh, checks that I always recommend people do. It can be done with a tool called Last Overlap, and we will do that soon. Um, what I wanted to show you now is that this little script I just ran created all these products automatically. This script called Quality Checking. You can look at the contents of this script, which is basically a little bit like training material. If you click on edit, uh, you know, it'll tell you how to do. All these are comments, and it tells you different commands, including a lot of text, what I'm doing here. Here's, for example, the last overlap command that created the overlap and the difference image. And any difference bigger than half a meter was dark red or dark blue. Um, and here the, dens the density, the density visualizations. It's also shown here how those were created. This is a little bit also, all these scripts, also like a training material because you can look up things. What I wanted to show you, LiDAR preparation, small project. I'm just double clicking this one now. This is now running last round. You see, I wrote that down once. With the option minus city and ultra fine. It stores it to a new file. It merges all these five different strips, because they're very small, like it merges them into one and produces a new file, and it's done. And then, 
it computes the height with the different tool, the height of all the points above the ground, and throws away all these very high points. And at the end, it does the last classification, trying to classify buildings and trees. And as I was speaking, it was doing all these things. So we can have a look at the result. This is the ground classification. I just computed without the GUI. It's just computed now. You see the ground, G, like before, ground, okay. Not ground, but then I have all these noise points up here. Then I used last height to throw away all points higher than 50 meters. And I got this one here. Ah, okay, that, that makes more sense. That looks nicer. And then I run last classify to classify building and trees. And I just did that just now. Totally automatic. You know, I didn't do any manual. Uh, and now I just classify it like that using last rules. And it's not perfect. There will be mistakes. But it's pretty good. Um, those are trees, those are buildings. But if you walk around, you will eventually find some errors. For example, here. I believe this is a warehouse, and there's a truck next to the warehouse unloading or loading goods. And it was classified as vegetation. Well, those errors happen. And anybody who claims his application software is error free, is most likely lying, because uh, yeah, those, those things are difficult to tell apart. But overall, given this just took a few seconds and we got a pretty nice application into, uh, and for example here, this, look at this structure, clearly this is not a tree. But it's also not really a typical building, this one here. I don't know what it is, maybe a... Huh? It's very tall, it's in France. I don't know what kind of... Yeah, maybe a clock tower or something. If I triangulate it, maybe I get a better... Yeah, yeah, let me see. I don't know what it is, but the laser was able to look under it. And then create all these. Well, it didn't look enough like a building to my algorithm, so it decided it's not a building. But overall, if I look at the scene, it, it got all the main buildings completely automatic. And then you can run the last script, which now uh, uses these LIDAR. No, what the previous script did, it used LIDAR and found ground points. It enhanced the LIDAR with ground information. Then it removed noise and enhanced the LIDAR again. Then it classified buildings and trees. Again, enhanced the LIDAR. But I always was within the LIDAR point cloud. Now this script generates derivatives, meaning new products that are not LIDAR, such as hill shades, um, various hill shades, colors differently. Oh. Not actually, this was an archaeological data set. 
and but I use it to automatically find the buildings, and then I can make a shape file with all the buildings that I found in the lidar, and I can load that into my GIS. Or that's where most of the vegetation is that the vegetation cover shape file, and that took me just a few seconds to create. It's not 100% correct, but it just took a few seconds to create. And if I have a large area and I want to get it 100% correct, I have to spend many, many man hours on doing that. If I quickly need to have a disaster area, I need to know how many sets of rice I need to order or how many evacuation uh, beds I need to uh, have. Knowing how many houses I have and how high the houses are maybe gives me a quick estimate of how many people will need to be evacuated, for example. I mean, it always depends on the application. Um, this is all possible with last tools, and this was scripted. I wrote the scripts, and you should be able to at least copy and modify the scripts in the future. But now we will do the same thing for not just a tile, this was just one tile, for a larger area by hand, step by step. But this is basically what we will be doing. Okay, so back to back to your binaries, back to the last tools. In the first step, what we will do, we will compute if the difference between the LIDAR flight lines is okay. If you get LIDAR and you do one quality check, I think this is the quality check you should do apart from visually looking at the line of it. The tool is called Last Overlap. Now be careful, there's a similar name tool called Last Overage, but that does something completely different. <coughs> Last Overlap is a tool I would like you to start. Just double click it. Click it. And again, you get the, you get the GUI. And the GUI will tell you quality check line up by that overlap, horizontal and vertical alignments. Okay, so now we're loading in new data. No more Poland, no more Pentagon. Now we're going to Ayutthaya. Yeah, Ayutthaya is one of the old uh, capital cities of uh, Thailand, very historic place. Maybe some, some people of know here know that the, the older people of you. Uh, who is that? Um, Summer of 69, who sings that? No, it was the other guy, the other soft rock guy. Bon Jovi, yeah, Bon Jovi. Living on a prayer guy, not living on a prayer. Bon Jovi has a music video in front of Thai temples. I don't know if it, which song it was. Maybe this ain't a love song or one of those songs. You remember that? It's like stupas and he's like rocking in front of those stupas and that's Ayutthaya. It was very popular in Thailand of course. I don't know why I know this. Uh, but here we go. Ayutthaya. Um, I go into the folder called strips raw, and strips means flight lines. Flight strips, flight lines is the same uh, term. And raw means those are just the strips like they come out of the lighter processing software after flying. That's basically when you have a scanner and you have a plane and you have all those sensors, you also have a software that takes in the, the configuration of the scanner, all these special calibrations. It takes in uh, the IMU, you know, the yaw, tilt, yaw and uh, uh, roll and uh, pitch, thank you, <laughs> uh, information, as well as all the GPS and the ground corrected GPS uh, information. And then it uses from the ranging that was stored during scanning, the XYZ point cloud 
in LAS form. And that's exactly what comes out. A line like this, another line, and another line. So these are three flight lines. These are not tiles, these are flight lines. And we can look at one of them. We should always look at data. Uh, now it's important because we have multiple, but for the first time we have more than one. You can actually click on them here. And you also see, let's close the browse button. You can see, uh, I can also use the arrow keys going up and down. And then you can look at the number of points. I have 8 million in the first flight line, number 2, almost 10 million in the other one, and 8 million again in the third one. Again, point type 1, point size 28. And now I want to look at only one of them, so I must check here, selected file only, otherwise you will load all of them. I press the view button, and I press start. And now, you see the way the plane was flying. That's exactly the acquisition order. I can press P and play it one more time. That's how the plane was flying. I mean, how it was scanned, the terrain. And that is a flight line. Now you basically see how the plane is flying. You see the turbulences, you know, slight turbulence. Go left, go right, go left, go right. The plane is about, I don't know, maybe 800 meters flies about in the middle, you know, right here where the plane is flying, with slight turbulences in the roll. The roll one you see here. What's the width? What's the width? What's the, uh, what's the width? The question? Well, let's just check it. I don't know. <coughs> I pick a point here. I press I. Now I go to the other side, roughly at the same angle. And I press Shift I. And Oh, I just realized I never measured such a large distance before because that's not a very nice display of the distance. But it's about 650 meters. So that's a you know, scientific location. How high is the airplane flying? Well, this is 650 meters. This depends on the scanning system you use. This is a, a Rigel 680i scanner with plus minus 30 degrees scan angle. And if you know that this is 60 degrees, you can now actually calculate how high the plane was flying with some basic trigonometry that I can't do right now, but anybody who has a calculator could easily do that, at least roughly. So 650 meters is the spread on the ground. And, well, that's just what I want to do. I want to look at the data. Maybe already now you notice there is data missing. Sometimes you don't see it's missing. You can change the background color to blue. Then you see it's missing. And actually the blue is a good color to choose. It's missing because there's a river here. And we learned earlier today that for river scanning, Actually, to get to the ground of the river, you need a you need a different laser. This is a, because the normal infrared, near infrared laser gets absorbed by water, and then you basically have a hole. So often, when you fly over something that is in water area, you just get no return. <clears throat> but that's actually a, I remember a company in Los Angeles. They wanted to use the public lidar and look for holes in the city, because then they knew that's where a swimming pool is, and then they would check if the swimming pool had a building permit, or if they could find the people for building a, a swimming pool without uh, applying for a building permit first. And there, how do you automatically get the swimming pools? Well, one strategy is you look for the holes in the, the lighter. Okay, that was just a quick visual check. Now we want to do a quality assessment. This checks how well these flight lines align with each other. Because there are three independent flight lines. 
and they could not be well matched. First of all, I must process all the files, because now we want to compare these files against each other. It's important to think about this checkbox. Are my files really fly points? In this case, yes. Before, I always had tiles. For the tiles, I would have to uncheck this. But in my case, really, I have three flight lines. So the files are flight lines. And uh, here I now can decide um, what, what difference in flight line is OK with me. Most of the time, my specification will say the difference should not be bigger than 20 centimeters or so when you write the liner survey tender guidelines. So I could say, I am allowing a difference of up to 20 centimeters. But if it's bigger than 20 centimeters, I want to know about it through a color coding. Color coding. Or I could output the actual difference values, but I want to create that color image now. Now I, all I need to specify where do I put the output image. And uh, I usually put everything that has to do with quality checking into one folder called quality. And if you go on this output, uh, if you roll that out, there's a button with three dots. And if you click that, you open a new, a new window. And you don't know where you are, so you can go up one directory. Ah, I am in this directory where the strips are. So I create a new directory now. I call that quality. quality. You can also create a directory directly in the Windows Explorer, but I got tired of doing this, so I put, I put myself an option here. <coughs> so once you create it, it comes up here. And then you go into the directory, go inside of it, and you click the button, use current directory. I show that one more time now. So to click, to select an output directory, I click here. I, uh, I don't know where I am, so I go up one directory, I see, oh, here I am. Oh, and here's a quality directory that I already created. If you haven't created it yet, you can create it down here. Then I'm going into the directory, and I press the Use Current button. We will do the same thing multiple times, so it's this like picking the directory will be almost crucial in every step afterwards. Now it's not crucial yet because it's just a quality check. But uh, would be good to learn that. Ah. Um, we will we will make one big raster, so we merge all these files into one, and I call it overlap. I actually don't like tip so much. Eng. So this will go with this file name into this directory. And that's all I needed to do. And this is a quality check. And I will tell you what the quality check does. I press run. And I get a new command line with a new tool called last overlap. And it has a new argument in the beginning that I haven't seen before called minus LOF. And that doesn't mean a laugh out frenetically, or it means list of files. And the <coughs> list of files is right here. So this file list, which was just created temporarily on your machine, contains the three flight lines. They are then merged, and I tell the software that each file is a flight line, FAF files are 
pipeline. And I tell it that the minimum difference I'm willing to accept is 20 centimeters. The maximum difference I didn't change. The default is half a meter. So. And I'll tell you in a second what it's doing. But it's the output directory, before we had old dicks, now we have old deer, output directory. It's the one I picked and created. And I want to create this file in. So what happens right now is that um, the tool is reading all slide lines, one after the other, and puts a grid of two meters Two meters because there's a step sum of two meters somewhere. Yeah. Puts a grid of two meters over all points. And for every flight line, it keeps the lowest point falling into the grid. For every flight line, separately. And at the end, whenever a grid cell has, for multiple flight lines, the lowest one, it compares them. Flight line one has a, in this cell a lowest point. Flight line two has a grid cell a lowest point. They won't be exactly the same usually. And now I look at the difference. Is the difference 10 centimeters? Then I make it white. Is it 19 centimeters? Then I make it white. Is it minus 27 centimeters? Then I start to color it slightly blue, this cell, because it's not perfect. Is it 47 centimeters, then it's almost completely red, that cell, because the difference is big. And I do this for every pixel, for every 2 by 2 meter pixel. And you should pick a step size that's big enough. More, yeah, not, not every point, but but they should be close enough in elevation for the mesh, yeah. Correct. That's why I'm using a 2 by 2 meter area to make a corner. I'm taking the lowest point of a 2 by 2 meter area and I'm hoping, more or less, that should be the same elevation. It's not always the case, but in open areas, on a road, for example, it should be the case. Except if I have uh, an air conditioning vent in the middle of the road because it's a subway then some laser beams may go into the subway and be very low, but that only happens occasionally. And if I look at the resulting images, now, now we have a quality folder here too, quality, and I have uh, an overlap image, first of all. that shows me the amount of overlap between my flights. So remember, I had three flights. One flight, two flights, three flights. And this flight and this flight are overlapping in this area. And the middle flight and this flight are overlapping in this area. There's no overlap here. And there's a one place here where all three are overlapping. Now I can only compute a difference in this area because there is no overlap here. I cannot compute a difference. I only have one flight line. Same here. So I want overlap so I can compute the flight line, how well they fit together. So the other image, no, other direction. This one, exactly where I have the overlap, will compute the difference image. Now, in the difference image, it's very important that all open areas are white. All open areas are white. That looks good. Now, there's, again, a road up here. The road is completely white. But there's a lot of structure which is not white. Well, there's a lot of houses in this area. And 
what happens? For the houses, it's very typical that you have one pixel along houses and buildings and other where it's drastically different, the elevation. And the reason is simple. Um, <coughs> imagine this is one pixel. This, this is one two by two meter pixel on a house. Yeah? And you see it's a little bit bigger than the roof. This is the roof. Now, if I'm, if I'm a plane, I'm a plane now, and I'm flying from here, and my fan of lasers is going this way, I can see the side of the house here. I can see down here. Right next to the house, I can see the lowest point. That means for this pixel, I can also see the roof, but I can also see the lowest point. For this pixel, my lowest point is down here. And now comes the other plane. The other plane flies here. It actually does not see down there. It has no points here in this area because the last point is here. And then the next point is somewhere here. And this is just empty. This is a shadow, the laser shadow. So if I compare these two flat lines in this, this pixel, one has the lowest point here and the other has the lowest point there. And that's why you guarantee to get red or blue. One pixel around every building. But only one pixel. If you get multiple pixels, then you notice a horizontal shift because I have one building here and another building here and I shift them because the flight lines are shifted. Then you also get that. But then you get more than one pixel. So if I get a single pixel around every house, Again, these are single pixel uh, differences. That's to be expected with this kind of quality check. What you want to look out for is having not this speckle. Basically, one side should always be red and the other should be blue. Then it's normal for areas where it's not flat. But when you have an area where it's like a strip of red or a strip of blue, completely blue, that's the thing you need to look out for. And if, if uh, I have several examples of this on the Facebook page, when I did a big tour in the Philippines, and we noticed on several occasions that just by accident, some flight line was not projected to the uh, geoid. It was still ellipsoidal heights, and one was photometric heights. Suddenly, you have a huge difference. These things are instantly visible in such a visualization and you can correct it before you start processing. But if I look at this data, I think, yeah, that looks fine to me. Um, because <coughs> these are only just red areas around buildings where I expect it. And vegetation also. The same as with vegetation, which I told you was buildings, except it's less clear defined. From one side, the laser can look under the tree. From the other side, it gets stuck in the tree. Same, same idea. OK. I don't want to bore you too much with quality checking. This is the one quality check I think you should always do before you start um, processing LIDAR. Making sure the pipelines are uh, matching each other. OK. But now let's do some real LIDAR processing. The first step, if you have flight lines, is always to tile the data, to create a tiling. Because before we always seen data in tiles. Well, that's because that's how you deliver data, and that's also how you process the data. And you probably won't be surprised that there is a tool that is called last tile. And what it does, it takes in LiDAR data and creates a tiling from it. And now this is the point. When you now miss any step, then, well, then you won't have all the future steps. You won't have the data for the future steps. That's why I did all these many exercises until now to get you to the point where you hopefully don't struggle with my GUI anymore. And 
you will be able to follow every step. So, last time is a tool I'm using now. And this will create the tiles that I will use in every other step thereafter. So, double clicking last tile gives us the usual the usual uh, interface, but a different tool. The standard tool is called last time. I'm going to Ayutthaya and I'm loading the raw flight lines because those are the ones that I will tile. Ayutthaya <laughs> strips raw. Uh, before I click three times, now imagine you have 200 flight lines or 58, and you have to click 58 times. Uh, there is something called a wild card. Anything matching this will be added. And since those all LAZ files, I'll just press this one. And then all three, all three show up here and have been added. And already now you, you see a suggested tiling in the background. These are one kilometer tiles. This would maybe be possible to use, but I want to make it a bit more interesting. And you can make it more interesting by using smaller tiles. We make the tiles 500 by 500 meters. And then when you click to a different field, you see the tiling is updated. Furthermore, when you do tile-based processing, you, you tend to make errors along the edges of every tile because you're missing information about the neighborhood. Uh, a very simple concept is called buffering. And I simply add a buffer of 30 meters around every tile and that helps me to avoid edge artifacts. So you will see that it puts a buffer around the tile and that buffer will be replicated in the neighboring tile. Only temporarily. At the very end, I remove the buffers. In order to quickly remove the buffers, on the fly, sometimes... Why is this 30 meters only? Why do logic mean this buffer? 30 meter buffer right What's the logic behind buffers? 30 meter. Uh, 30 meter uh, yeah, uh, I want to make the buffer bigger than the biggest building that I suspect to be there. Yeah. Uh, why, why to use buffers? Uh, in general, any, I don't know, you, you, most of you probably don't celebrate Christmas, but maybe you've seen some American pop culture or German pop culture where people make Christmas cookies. Or maybe you made Diwali cookies. No? Anyway, what you do is you make a dough and then you roll out the dough. And you basically also use buffering when you make the cookies because you never cut the cookie right at the edge of the dough because that's where the dough is not, uh, doesn't have a clear, you know, you wouldn't get a clean edge for the cookie, but it's a bit crumbly. And basically those buffers prevent crumbly edges along the LIDAR cookies or the LIDAR tiles. Um, the buffer is basically rolling out the dough a little bit bigger than the cookie. That's clear. I, my question is why it is 30 meters? Oh. Uh, I don't know. Which, which kind of uh, I mean, scene? It depends, yeah, it, it depends on the scene you have. Okay. Oh. There are two tools where the buffer size is really important for last round and last to them. The buffer should be bigger than the step in last round. That's the one important thing. And when you make, um, when you have big water bodies like rivers, then ideally the other shore of every river should also be in the tile. So when you make a DTM, and you want to close all the holes, you have something to connect to that's still in the buffer. 
So you can fill the pixels with some meaningful values. That doesn't always work because that's some really big water bodies. Um, I usually use between 30 and 50 meters depending on how difficult the terrain is. Except in mobile, they, mobile, then I use much smaller. This is sort of for airborne. This is a very advanced question. First, the important thing is you must use buffers because if you don't use buffers, even just 10 meters buffers, uh, you get you get an error around every tile if you don't use buffers uh, because ground classification will make a mistake, height normalization will make a mistake, uh, vegetation and building classification they'll all make a mistake at the very edge of the tile. In extreme cases, up to 10, 20 meters, but always definitely the first one, two, three meters. So using any size buffer is already better than using no buffer. And uh, I just want to mention the concept really. When in doubt, use 30 meters. <laughs> so and then flagging the points in the buffer to be with a special flag. So I can easily drop them later. That's a new thing uh, I added recently. Well, first of all, the tiles are used for parallelizing the processing. Once I have the data in tiles, I can give one tile to one CPU and the other tile to the other CPU and the other tile to the other CPU. <coughs> and because they have a buffer, um, even so I process them independently at the end, they all fit together nicely once I remove the buffer. So A, parallel processing, and B, memory consumption. I can't load everything into uh, a last suit has a two gigabyte limit. So each process can only be two gigabytes, no matter how many gigabytes you have on your laptop. Even if you get your laptop has 32 gigabytes, the process, every process is a 32 bit process and it can handle only two gigabytes. But designing it like this is beneficial anyway, because having many small processes is faster having a gigantic chunk of data uh, and then processing on that. So, our files are flight lines, this is correct. And what else would I want to do? I want to... Uh, Take an output folder. We did that before. I'm using the button with the three dots to create a new folder that I call tiles underscore raw. Because those will be now my raw tiles. I'm going from raw strips to raw tiles. Um, it's not clear where we are, so we go up one directory. Ah, okay, right next to this directory strips raw. And that's why I already says tiles because I always name my directories like this. The raw tiles, sometimes I call them buffer tiles or tiles buffer. So now that we, we, we read the data from here and we go into this directory. I go into the directory and I click use current. I do that one more time. Output. Here's my tiles raw directory. I go into the directory and press use current. And one other thing I like to always point out, how will the tiles be named? Well, they're all going to get a name, a new name now. And I like to choose a good name. Um, if you don't do anything, they all will be named tile something something. And if this is the only time in your life that you do LIDAR, that's okay. Because you will always go, oh, this is a tile something something from the day that Martin came. Yeah, I remember. But if you actually process LIDAR regularly, and in two years you find something called tile something something, you're like, 
Whether, whether, whether now from this one, or whether that from there, or... No, that was, just give it a simple acronym so you remember. Like, are you tired? Are you? Huh? That's enough. That will help you instantly know this is from the Ayutthaya project. Something that helps you remember. Believe me, it's a little thing, but a few years later it helps you a lot. Otherwise you have to open GIS software and look where it lands with the projection. So I think I'm done now. I select the output folder, I create a tiling, uh, tile size 530 meters, I flag the points as withheld, the flights are flight lines. Yeah. I press run. And as always, and now slowly it should start to look familiar. You know, I again get my minus laugh out frenetically or rather list of files option. I can check are these the right list of files in this rollout folder. Yes, these are the three Ayutthaya flight lines. I give them the name iu.laz. The file size is 500 with buffers of 30 meters. Points in the buffer are flagged as was held. The three files are flight lines. And I put it in the following output directory. Sounds all good to me. Uh, if you accidentally click somewhere, like I just did, then, then it goes into the background. So if, if you now press run, nothing will happen. Because it's already there somewhere. Here it is. And actually, uh, the black control window, I press three times and it tells me, no, no, you can't do that. You know, you already have, you already have the start window open. And then I'm pressing start. So what it does now, it will read one script after the other and put the points into different tiles. And also because of this, files are flight lines. It will give all the points from the first file, the number one, in the point source ID field. It will give all the points from the second flight line, the number two, and all points from the third one, the number three. So later on, when you have a tile, I still know which points are together from one flight line. We saw that earlier when I pressed zero, one, two, three, four, in the colon, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I could see the flight line there from. Oh no. Anybody else? Has this happened? Uh, this happened with the main before lunch, many times. <laughs> this is very. What did I do now? No input specified. Okay. Sorry. I remember I did something funny. I pressed start a few times. That was probably something I've never done before. And I didn't think it would cause any harm. Well, gives you the chance to watch one more time how I set up the software. That was actually done on purpose. I load all the tiles, I select the output directory, I draw, use current, I tile size 500, output 30, uh, IU, lag as with health, Lines. I think that's it. Uh, that all the points that are going into the buffer are getting flagged. I give them a flag. You are 
You always held like you said. Every point can have three different flags that are on or off. With held, synthetic, and key point. This is useful sometimes to quickly remove the buffer points because there's an option called drop with held. And then all the with held points are dropped. It's one of the filters in, in one of those filters here is drop with held. Sometimes uh, beneficial later on. I'm um, just quickly checking whether this helps, yeah? I'll just do mine one more time. It's last one pretty fast. It seems to have crashed when it tried to delete the file at the end. For some reason. Because uh, when it, when it has more than one file, on, on your disk it creates a file containing the names of all the files. Minus LOF, it's a list of files, an ASCII file containing all the files.
so far. I loaded in the tiles we created from the tiles raw directory. And I created a new output directory called tiles ground. I'm going into this directory and I'm using it for the output. And then I left this where it was. I check this ultra, and one more thing I want to do, I want to compute the heights. Because computing the heights above the ground and storing them into one of the fields of the last file is needed for making the classifications into building trees. If all I want to do is make DTM, there's no reason to do that. But if I'm interested in doing other classification, I need to know the height of every point above the ground. And now, one more thing. Now I can use multi-core processing. I don't know what kind of laptop you have, but if your laptop has more than one CPU, we have 60 tiles. We can distribute the tiles onto different cores. Now, it's important to never use more jobs than you have cores. So I have eight cores. I'm going to use four jobs. If you have two cores, then use two jobs. But don't use four, because it will slow you down, because the jobs will be fighting each other. Uh, so you can either do run on all cores, or what I often do, run on all minus one core. Then you have one core left, so you, that you can go on Facebook and you know update your status. I'm doing some really cool live up because I think it was last cool, something like that. Okay, so I'm running on four. Go. Okay. Now I'm pressing start. Huh? Oh, we don't, uh, yeah, good point. We don't need a file name because we go from one directory, tiles raw, that's the input directory, to a new directory, tiles ground. All the file names remain the same. And that's basically what we always will be doing when we do uh, tile-based processing. We just go from one directory to the next, then we can always go back, if we make a mistake, to the previous directory and start from there again. Yeah, finally, I almost only use when I create tiles or when I work on a single file. Uh, and then I go one file to another file and then give it a Okay, now I press run and I look at my command line. Last round, list of files and look at this list of files this time. So many of them, all these tiles. I run in four cores with the options city and ultrafine, I compute the height above the ground when I'm done with the ground, and I put all the output again in compressed format into this output directory. Tiles ground. And then I look, oh, it's one minute past four, time for the lunch. Uh, coffee, uh, not coffee, tea. Tea break, so I press start. And I don't touch it anymore. And now the same algorithm I described before, with city, meaning the grid is 25 meters by 25 meters, looking for the lowest points, finding the initial ground, and so on. It's now running on all the tiles. Okay, if you managed to get that far, you can now have T. If not, you must bother your neighbor to help you to get that far. And I can have T. I'm out there all along, you think we won't come up to the other one. 